I'm Gauri Divedi. Let's kick start the show with some headlines this Monday evening. First up, China Russia complete first round of joint military drills. The drills aim to deepen cooperation and address security threat that the two nations feel. United States pledges $200 million in fresh aid to Bangladesh. The aid is expected to support inclusive growth and economic support to Bangladesh. India's US drone deal faces scrutiny. India to buy 31 MQ-9B drones from the United States. Uh, how these had shot down 10 MQ drones this year. Scores dead in Myanmar from flooding after Typhoon Yagi. At least 320,000 people have been displaced, over 100 people dead and 64 still missing. India to send $1,000 of aid to flood hit Laos. Aid to include 10 tons of relief material and medical supplies for the nation. Alright, the first story on India Global that we're addressing right now is the latest as far as Bangladesh is concerned. Now, Bangladesh has been a country that's been in the flux, uh, in flux since the 5th of August when uh, Sheikh Hasina fled Dhaka. And since then, the country has been coming to terms with the turmoil it faced. Now, the latest is that... Uh, the country has got over $200 million of fresh aid from the United States. Senior officials of uh, the U.S. State Department visited Bangladesh. And besides the aid package that has been given to Dhaka, several other issues were also discussed, including the reform roadmap that UNIS's government has in place that will pave the way for democratic credentials and the democratic framework to be restored and that's the big question that we are asking right now that as United States increases and gives fresh aid to Bangladesh is it looking at a larger role remember Sheikh Hasina had made some very sweeping allegations about eight months back that there could be an alleged role of United States in that region with US's fresh aid package those allegations do they need to be addressed is America looking to play a larger role? Remember, Mohammed Yunus also shares a good rapport with senior members of the United States administration. Where does this leave India? What is the US, uh, India, Bangladesh equation set to be now? Is India also going to look to make fresh aid and line of credit offers and disbursements to Bangladesh? That's the big question that we will be discussing on India Global. But first up, let's get my colleague uh, Mohammad Ghazali to fill us in with the very latest. Uh, Mohammad, appreciate you joining us uh, to take us through what we can expect as far as the next course of action in Bangladesh is concerned. This meeting by the State Department officials is very crucial. New Delhi is keeping a very close watch on. Tell me, what are your sources telling you on this? See, this particular meeting was expected last week. The State Department had issued a statement that how a delegation from the United States will go to Bangladesh and will meet the higher functionaries there, including Mohammed Yunus, the chief of chief advisor of the interim government there. And besides the aid package, though the State Department officials or the statement claim that perhaps this aid will bring uh, inclusive uh, to check the growth, uh, declining growth there, and Bangladesh's economy had taken a hit after the Russia-Ukraine war started, uh, and to just for the course correction, Mr. Yunus was asking for aid and in a televised address last Tuesday also he had appealed for $5 billion aid. Uh, but when Bangladeshi experts were contacted, perhaps they thought that Bangladesh's interim advice, uh, the chief advisor of the interim government was only asking aid from uh, uh, the international organizations when he didn't want a bilateral support. But US is stepping in with this aid is very significant because as you rightly pointed out, uh, just a couple of months ago when Sheikh Hasina was facing a lot of rebellion, she had hinted that perhaps there could be an involvement or this entire rebellion could be engineered by one of the US State Department officials. That was a grave allegation. No clarification uh, or, or sort of comment was given by the US State Department about it. But this meeting is very significant considering the point that uh, US also wants to involve itself with the new administration there. Uh, earlier, the Bangladesh watchers perhaps said that Mr. Yunus uh, will not seek any aid from neighboring countries. But yes. with this, uh, 
significant aid coming from US, perhaps more countries are also expected uh, to gain dominance in Bangladesh by providing them aid. Absolutely. Mohammad Ghazali, appreciate you joining us on India Global this uh, Monday evening. Let's uh, open this up. Uh, Ayanjit Sen, uh, international affairs expert with me on the show. We also have Dr. Ashikur Rahman, uh, principal economist, uh, Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh. Dr. Rahman, let me start with you, sir. Uh, as things stand, uh, in the last one month, uh, uh, Dr. Mohammad Yunus, when he took over as the, as the advisor, he mentioned that he was in favor of aid coming in from international agencies and not so much from bilateral aid arrangements. Why the change? And does this indicate a larger role for United States in the present dispensation? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I think uh, this particular U.S. aid, uh, the pipeline was started in 2001. And uh, $1 billion was committed under USAID program, out of which Bangladesh has already received uh, $450 million. So the $202 million that has been promised under that pipeline is basically adding to that uh, $450 that has already been received and another $300 million that is owed under that pipeline. So it's, uh, you know, Bangladesh has a line of credit with India and Bangladesh has a line of credit with China and USAID also had a pipeline uh, for last five years, 21 to 26. That's the pipeline. So, yes, you're correct that uh, fresh installments are coming in that uh, from that pipeline. But the amount, as you see, it's only 200 million. Uh, it's a useful grant, but it's nothing fundamental. I think what Bangladesh, uh, you have correctly pointed that the interim government has very close relationship with U.S. What Bangladesh needs, and I think we have discussed it in your uh, the show earlier that is market access. Vietnam pays 5% tariff on RMG while Bangladesh pays 17%. Okay. So what uh, what Bangladesh really needs from US is not charity, right. but market gonna, access. We're going to come to that. that. We test. will come to that as well. But uh, uh, Ayanjit Sen, the question is, if America is is uh, looking or is America looking to now play a larger role in a dispensation which it is now more favorably disposed to as against the previous dispensation of Sheikh Hasina, which had also made some very, very serious allegations against a possible American role in that region. Uh, well, yes, I think uh, the American position definitely has changed, uh, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what, uh, what was it during uh, Sheikh Hasina's regime. And uh, currently, uh, for example, what happened today, the dispensation that they have given to the Bangladesh um, uh, interim government. So that clearly, in a way, indicates the change in the American position. And also one more aspect important as to uh, figure out whether this will precipitate in any way uh, to do with uh, further uh, help coming in from uh, countries which Bangladesh may not, ex uh, may not have expected or may not be expecting, but uh, there may be some surprises on the way post this uh, US decision. You say it decision. will open floodgates because to more bilateral aid coming in for Bangladesh, right? Yeah, that's something but that's which exactly uh, I think... that's exactly what uh, Mohammed Yunus said he did not want. But that's something which uh, Mohammed Yunus can say he doesn't want it. But at the end of the day, the current Bangladesh economy, as it is as it stands, of course, it's uh, you know coming through debt uh, all, all across. And uh, there would be... Uh, countries which would be ready to give some aid, but it all depends whether UNIS accepts it or not. That's a sec second uh, point of action. But at least what the American uh, uh, disbursement, what uh, the decision that the American has, uh, Americans have taken today is definitely going to open the floodgates for sure. Okay. But it depends uh, on... Mr. Which Sen, I'm going to come to back to ask you about the India position on this. Where does, what should be New Delhi's options? But Dr. Rahman, talk to me about, about the fact that if America is looking to play a larger role, Mohammed Yunus is also looking to revisit his earlier position that he would prefer only multilateral agencies to fund Bangladesh's next phase of uh, restoration of the economy, so to say. In the wake of these changes, where does this leave the, the Bangladesh-America relationship and is it now completely transformed under Mohammed Yunus's tenure in just a couple of weeks? So, as I said, that um, the aid or loans uh, on its own, as a, if I may speak frankly, I don't see will be fundamental 
in transforming Bangladesh. Bangladesh is uh, competing in a global market with countries like relationship, Vietnam. Relationship, America, and, Bangladesh yeah. relationship. Yes, so I, I personally feel, yes, you can say that it is a, they have a special relationship now with the interim government. But if, if really U.S. has to walk the talk in terms of proving its friendship, it will come down to far, far bigger questions concerning market access and how, what kind of tariff Bangladeshi products face in U.S. market. Because okay, I'm sure, the I'm sure if there is larger Bangladesh alignment, trade. some of these trade specific issues can also be ironed out. And that's not yes. my question, so that is, sir. That is my going question to be the asset test for right. uh, the government. Because right. charity These are trade-related, tariff-related specific issues. My question is slightly larger, which is that, Sorry. Dr. Rahman, in just a couple of months, there's been a complete transformation in America's position as far as Bangladesh is concerned. Does this now impact Dhaka's relationship with New Delhi as well? So uh, I feel that there is a, you know, you know that there is, there has been tension uh, cooking up in terms of how they see each other. But I don't feel in the larger spectrum, U.S., India, and Bangladesh um, can have a very adverse relationship, because at the end, uh, if you look at the uh, bipolar situation between China and U.S., uh, India will, Bangladesh uh, will have a very strong interest to maintain. Uh, good relationships with India, because at the end, that's our largest neighbor. So I don't feel, yes, U.S. has improved its relationship with Bangladesh, but I don't think that will come at the cost of India's relationship. It is uncertain at this point, okay. but I think it will improve in the future. Ayanjit Sen, I'm running out of time, sir, very quickly. What are New Delhi's options from here on with America playing a much larger role in Bangladesh now? Well, I think it's a two-pronged thing. First of all, I would say uh, it's a wait-and-watch policy that uh, New Delhi has adopted. And uh, that's something which uh, will continue for some time because they want to actually gauge the current situation and uh, what it would lead to in the near future first. And secondly, to do with the fact that uh, whether U.S. is given, that's another thing. But uh, India has already played a pivotal role as far as uh, giving aid to Bangladesh is concerned in the past, near past as well. And from that perspective, uh, it's. Uh, I think it will only grow better, but all depends on what okay. steps uh, Delhi takes, because right. it's still a wait and watch policy. Yes, exactly. wait and watch policy, or some would even call it New Delhi's strategic patience, because it has been very patiently waiting for things to stabilize in Bangladesh before it takes the next course of action. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking out the time and joining me on India Global. We slip into a very short break. We come back on the other side and talk more about China's maritime warfare. It is engaging with Russia for very intensive maritime drills and at the same time aggressively posturing against Philippines. What can India do? What lies ahead? We come back and talk more. Welcome back. You're watching India Global with me, Gauri Diveti. Now, the second uh, debate that we are looking at today is the latest as far as China's maritime warfare is concerned. Its intent has been clear for the last decade, but in the last couple of days, it has pushed the pedal once again. There are two things that have happened. One, it has collaborated with Russia to come out with the most extensive maritime drills and naval drills between the two countries. And in fact, the biggest for post-Soviet Russia, so to say. Secondly, China is also once again uh, posturing in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's uh, been having skirmishes with Philippines the last couple of weeks and there has been a latest instance there as well. So that brings us to ask two fundamental questions. One is what should be the priorities as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned? Remember these exercises between China and Russia took place in the Sea of Japan, one of the four countries of Quad. US, Japan, India and Australia are the four quad countries and given that there's a quad meeting that will take place next week on the 21st, should this now be a key focus area for the four leaders? That's a big question that we are asking on India Global. Besides, what should be India's strategy for the Indian Ocean region where China has been looking to play a larger role? All right, let's open this up. Don McLean Gill, who's joining me from Manila. He's a geopolitical analyst with Taylor Sal University. Thank you so much, Don, for taking out the time. And we also have Mr. Shashank, former Foreign Secretary. Thank you so much, sir, for speaking to me on India Global. Uh, in fact, let me 
start with you, Don. Uh, there have been multiple instances as far as Chinese Coast Guard hitting out on Philippines uh, ship. The latest indicates that Philippines may have even withdrawn from an island that falls within its exclusive economic zone. Are we going back to the same Scarborough Shoal area, Scarborough Shoal, all over again? And, and how does Philippines read this current situation? What are its options? How does it want to play the Chinese aggression this time around? Well, thank you so much for having me, Ms. Gori. And uh, of course, uh, this is an important question. But we must understand that the Philippines has not withdrawn from the Escoda or Sabina Shoal, uh, okay. but rather uh, the ship, uh, the BRP Teresa Magbanwa, which is the largest uh, Philippine Coast Guard ship uh, merely returned to Manila due to the structural damages that China had caused it uh, and the depleted supplies. But nonetheless, there is an alternative ship uh, that is on its way. Uh, to Sabine Squad Shoal to maintain the Philippine presence there in its lawful exclusive Okay, that's an important zone. clarification. But nevertheless, as things stand right now, how is Manila now playing it? Has it learned its lessons from Scarborough Shoal? Is it willing to, to respond to China in the currency that it best understands? Talk to us about that. Absolutely, uh, Ms. Gori. And uh, you have to understand that the Scarborough Shoal, the illegal occupation of China, of Scarborough Shoal in 2012 was due to its ability to exploit the gaps in uh, the Philippine response uh, within its exclusive economic zone. But what happened here in the Sabina Escoda Shoal particularly uh, was that the Philippine, the Philippine Coast Guard as early as April was able to recognize that China had plans to discreetly pursue land reclamation activities and research in that area. So it immediately sent its largest ship. Uh, the BRP Teresa Magbanwa has been there since April. And and China has been very frustrated about this because okay. it wanted to occupy the area uh, discreetly. But, you know, we've shown light on its uh, illegal tendencies. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shashank, sir, let me ask you this. One is, of course, the Philippine aspect of it that, that uh, you know, Dawn is talking about in detail. The second is that these comes just days ahead of a court meeting that is scheduled to take place in New York, where the four leaders will meet. Will China's aggression in the Indo-Pacific dominate the court meeting now? Well, there is no doubt about it that China would be one of the important subjects of discussion because Quad is a cooperation mechanism which we have tried to develop for the Indo-Pacific and especially to counter Chinese muscle flexing. And Philippines is the most important case where even though there was an international court of justice uh, decision, but that was not accepted by China and Philippines somehow uh, because of their own position that they were not getting that kind of support from the Americans and others, which they were expecting. So they decided to succumb to the Chinese pressures. I think what we have to do is to see how Quad can help uh, strengthen the resolve of the uh, neighbors of China, especially wherever they claim this nine dash line, that they are able to take care of their territorial interests. Uh, India has been helping Philippines in some ways, yes. uh, some of their uh, Brahmos missiles, etc., and some other things which are which Philippines needs, uh, they are being uh, given to them. But I'm sure that there will be further discussion on this issue yes. in the Quad meeting. Ambassador Shang, then let me ask you another question, which is around the fact that what about specific uh, options for New Delhi because this is of course muscle flexing some would say is happening in areas that is not completely in, in New Delhi's backyard but nevertheless India is a very important stakeholder in the Indo-Pacific and these do indicate clear muscle flexing and aggressive posturing by China. Well what we are finding is that this European struggle which is going on between Russia and Ukraine and where Ukraine has been asking for longer range missiles to hit Russia in its interior portions has been making Russia more and more dependent on China and China feels that well it can count on Russian support and also do much more muscle flexing in the Asian region. Uh, I think India has to ensure that it has to continue with its supply lines of defense equipment etc from Russia. At the same time it has to directly tell China that it will not accept any kind of muscle flexing from the Chinese side as far as India is concerned. And it will work together with the other Asian countries yes. and uh, as, as well as the Quad countries to see that 
if any kind of solution can be found that China can behave more peacefully and accept the code yes. of conduct which was accepted with, between the ASEAN countries and China. Yes. Uh, Don, I think a lot of people say one of the biggest failures of America in the Indo-Pacific has been in its inability to deal with how China browbeat Philippines and how it has been doing so, it continues to do so. Uh, do you see that there could be greater dialogue, cooperation between America and Philippines in the wake of China's aggressive posturing in the Indo-Pacific? Well, absolutely. You know, the uh, the failures of uh, U.S. deterrence, particularly in the Western Pacific in the early 2000s leading up to 2012, uh, was not only a setback for the Philippines, but also a setback of the U.S. security position in the region, which China has been able to exploit. Uh, but now I think the stakes have become too high for Washington to ignore what is taking place in the Western Pacific in the West Philippine Sea. So interestingly, after the June 17th incident where Chinese Coast Guard forces cut off a finger of our Filipino sailor, the U.S. showed that it was more committed to uh, escort Philippine ships, but it was in fact Manila uh, that turned down the proposition temporarily. So exactly. I think that the U.S. is realizing that stakes have become too high to ignore. Right. Uh, stakes have become too high. What happened under Barack Obama's tenure should most certainly not happen anytime now. Ambassador Shashank, very quickly, sir, I'm running out of time, which is that this aggressive posturing comes at a time when there's some thaw between India and China on, its, on, on the border talks for the last four years. Explain to us, connect these two dots for us, sir. Well, some defense experts have been saying that America is feeling somewhat ashamed that it has not come to the rescue of Philippines and Taiwan the way these countries were ex expecting the American support. So therefore, America has been trying to put China and India against each other in the beginning so that Chinese attention is more towards the land borders and land conflict with India rather than towards the uh, ocean side. India, on the other hand, feels that, well, look, uh, there are other issues which are going on. China wants to become a superpower on the global scale. And therefore, India feels that, well, the land border disputes where China can be persuaded to withdraw uh, from the areas and our foreign minister has said right. that 75% evacuation has take, taken place. So India has to take look after its own interests. Right. Absolutely. India needs to take care of its own interests. We need to stand up to this aggression and we've been doing so for the last four years relentlessly. Most importantly, these China's maritime aggression needs to now be dealt with very, very severely and clearly. As I said, what happened during Barack Obama's tenure should be a lesson and a wake-up call and shouldn't happen again ever. All right, on that note, Tom McLean, uh, Gil and Ambassador Shashank, thank you so much for taking out the time and speaking to me on India Global. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition. Thank you so much for watching.